ladies and gentlemen, founder of Singapore-based Web and Travel and editorial director of the North Star Travel Group in Asia, Yo Su Hoon. <laughs> Thank you. And here to discuss, debate, and deliberate the next big thing, please welcome the three lions of online travel in the USA, Paul English, CEO Lola, Brett Gertzner, CEO Ultimata Capital, and Steve Hafner, co-founder and CEO Kayak. So guys, you know, I feel a bit like I'm been put in a lion's cage. <laughs> this is really intimidating. But uh, before we get on to the next big thing, okay, let's start with the now big thing, all right? And what's yeah. the now big thing is we're going to show the house <laughs> that Steve bought. All what? right, can we have the, the house that Steve bought? Whoa. All right, and uh, Steve, <laughs> so how much did you pay for that? <laughs> This is what we do in Asia. We ask those questions. Yeah, that's, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> that's just a rendering that doesn't actually exist. But uh, next year, you will be able to find that on Booking.com if you're looking for a place to stay for Focus Right. <laughs> right. But more importantly, when are you going to throw it open to a fo Focus Right party? Anytime. All right, Anytime. Fantastic. OK, next picture. So Brett, <laughs> <laughs> Brett, is your house bigger and better than that? No, D Steve definitely has a bigger crystal ball than me. Is that right? <laughs> okay, for sure he has, because I remember, was it last year that I saw you on stage and you were wearing those Snapchat spectacles? Yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll haunt me. Yeah and, yeah, and I just got an email today saying that Snapchat basically misjudged the strong early demand and they've ended up with a huge oversurplus of those spectacles. Yeah, it's a shocker that uh, you know, Silicon Valley-backed company estimated they were going to sell 100 million pairs and instead sold 1,000, but, you know, happens on occasion. So that was clearly not the next big thing? No. All right. No. <laughs> so, Paul, a truck full of money? Did you make a truck full of money with that book? <laughs> that book has caused me to lose a truck full of money. <laughs> <laughs> what did, I mean, you didn't make anything from it, right? I mean, we're talking about money here. You didn't make anything from nope. it? Nope. Nothing. <laughs> All no, right. it's a, it, I mean, with this case, he's a Pulitzer Prize-winning author. He gets all the cash, um, but it definitely has increased my charitable giving because I'm getting hit up a lot as a result of that book, okay, which is but, good. But clearly, that experience has enriched you internally, so well, a lot more wealth hopefully. that way. Okay, now we move on to the next big thing, the next big thing, and uh, I want to show a picture of the moon that I took. Not, I didn't take that. I'm sorry, Stephen Joyce, are you there? Uh, he took it with an iPhone from an Uber telescope on a private island in Indonesia called Champada. All right. So actually, there are thousands of islands out there. I think that you guys should buy one of them. Perfect. Honestly, it's, it, it's fantastic. So I just wanted to ask, uh, like, what tools or methods do you guys use to predict the next big thing? Or as Joe Cutler say, how, how do you develop that first principles thinking? Brad? Um, <clears throat> so a, a technique we use with, with our analysts is to develop, start with the narrative. So I think we oftentimes, you know, whether you're running a company or whether you're trying to build a forecast as an investment analyst, you oftentimes are so in the weeds on the next, you know, 30 days, the next 90 days, the next six months, you build a forecast that looks very linear. It looks like everybody else's forecast. But I want to have you describe the, how the world's going to look in three years, in five years. And if you do that in narrative form, if you actually write out the way you expect it to look, the forecast that we build, whether it's for Priceline or a startup company, is just quantifying that narrative. So if one of my analysts brings me a forecast and it says, you know, Priceline's growth is going to go from 25% to 23% to 20%, it looks like everybody else's forecast, but really understanding where are we in the evolution of online travel? Who are the players going to be? And so, I, you know, I don't think there's anything particularly unique about it, but telescoping out and really starting with the narrative instead of starting with the forecast. And, and if I'm running a business, it's doing the same thing. It's describing where we're going to be in three years and why we're going to be relevant, and then reverse engineering. So, it's, so it's more about telling the story and not so much the numbers. Right, the numbers, yeah. uh, the, the, as I said, the numbers are really the, the, the 
uh, simply the quantifying the forecast. They ought to tell the story of the forecast numerically. Okay. So, so Paul, you were described in the book. I, re I read reviews of the book, and I will be reading the book. Um, but you were described as a, a mind for the age that is coming. That, that was how they described you, you know? I didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the, so how do you develop a mind like that, first of all? But what is the age that is coming? Yeah, I mean, the way I think about the future is I spend a lot of time trying to identify problems in the present and talking to actual customers about what's working, what's not working. I think the best inventors in the world are people who focus on problems before they focus on solutions. There are a lot of tech companies that fail because they build solutions for things that no one cares about. So I think the most important thing you can do as an inventor is talk to your customers and try to really, really understand what the problems they have. And once you understand that, then you just build the first version of the product, which is probably going to be terrible, and you get feedback, and you build the second version, you iterate as fast as you can. Okay, do you, do you agree with that, with that, Steve? Because if you're solving the problem, aren't you then always stuck in the present? No, I, I don't. I mean, I, to, to my mind, I think Paul's spot on. You know, Brad, maybe not so much, but um, <laughs> it, it's all about seeing a problem that nobody else sees that's a real problem. So, if, so for me right now, I'm, I'm all about um, what's going to happen with the, with the automotive industry. If you think about the, hum the, the capital invested in cars and the real estate invested to support those, when I walk out of this hotel and see a lot of parked cars, I see that as a problem that needs to be solved. And I think a lot of other companies are, are looking at that and they're imagining a world 15 years from now where people's second biggest capital asset isn't their, isn't their car after their home, it's something else, like an experience like travel. And you think about all the money that's sitting in steel parked outside and all the real estate supporting that and what can be done with that. And, that, and that's, that's probably not what you guys think about when you walk outside the hotel and see cars parked in the street. But that's a problem. And that's, that's where the next big thing is going to come from. It's from people looking at problems that other people don't recognize are problems. Right. Actually, this is interesting, Paul, because um, I, I, I heard a, a speech by a, um, Nikki Abdinor. She's a clinical psychologist. And she was born with uh, no arms and no legs. And she gave a speech, and she said that basically, like all of us have disabilities, but some, but her advantage is that you can actually see her disability. <laughs> <laughs> and she said that um, the thing about her is what she does every day of her life is just solving problems. So she was just solving the current, and then she was anticipating the next problem. So I just thought that that's a nice trend cool. of thought. Cool. So, so now let's talk about a few companies that are trying to look for the next big thing. So Alibaba, right? Um, Jack Ma. Mad man or genius? Genius. Genius? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean it, it's pretty famously, right, was rejected from several schools, failed to pass exams for teaching schools, rejected by Harvard. You know, I think if you measure him on the dimension of, you know, genius, I'm, I'm not sure whether or not he stacks up. I would say tenacious, right, long-term in his thinking, mm. ambitious. I think the rejection probably drove a lot of that tenacity. Um, but certainly, you know, to, to, uh, I think too often entrepreneurs um, think that genius is required. And what I think it's about is getting up every effing day and taking three scoops of dirt and moving toward the goal. And so I think ambitious goals and a relentless attacking of those ambitious goals. Right. So do you think that Steve is a genius because you gave him a million dollars the first time you met him? Uh, that, that is, that is true. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, it was a business okay, deal. It was a business deal, just in case you're wondering. It was a business deal. deal. Okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, so Alibaba, <clears throat> he's spending $15 billion on research and development, and he wants to do data intelligence, Internet of Things, and FinTech and quantum computing. If you had 15 billion to spend on research and development, what would you spend on? One thing. I mean, listen, I think the things he's spending on map up against what there's a fair bit of consensus on are the next big things. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I look at that and say his fundamental advantage is a hundred year view supported by a government with a long-term imperial view of technology on a global basis. And so to not invest in those things, I think if you have the capital advantage they have, 
would be malfeasance. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know many companies today that say, well, I'm not going to invest in machine learning or I'm not going to invest in AI or I'm not going to, I mean, quantum is out there, but, you know, Google and Facebook and other companies are investing in it. So it seems to me to be... So 100-year view backed by a government with a long-term imperial view, does that give China an unfair advantage, you think, in this next decade? Absolutely not. I mean, it gives them an unfair advantage in China. Okay. You know, and, and, and I think in that operating climate there, they have the leeway to make investments that perhaps others don't. And uh, they'll, they'll bear uh, some return from that. But, uh, you know, I think Chinese companies will have as, as big a, a difficulty going overseas as, as European and American companies have going into there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, to go back to your original question, where would I make the investment? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with, like, Cost. With well, not cars, transport, but you know, I, I think the the way to make the play there is 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 to invest in Google stock, and and I wouldn't be adverse to buying back some Priceline stock too. Okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> Paul, I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, Elon Musk, Darth Vader, or Han Solo? <laughs> Han Solo. I'm a huge fan. Um, I I ordered. I own a Model S. I ordered a Model Three. I can't wait to get it. Um, also, a big fan of Powerwall. Looking forward to using that in a project I have in Haiti. I think, I think it's just extraordinary the amount of stuff that he's pushing ahead. Which particular invention are you most excited about? Probably, um, I mean, the car is, ama I'm a car person, and I think the Tesla's the best car I've ever owned, but I think actually the combination of solar and the batteries, I think, can transform countries. Okay. I'll, so, I'll take the under on that, by the way. Yeah. I don't think Tesla ever makes a penny as a standalone company. Well, China is making its own, uh, you know, next next EV, and I think Baidu Capital Partners is, is investing. In I it. mean, I think it's undeniable that he has dramatically changed the conversation. I don't know of any entrepreneur that's had his scale of impact on things ranging from space to solar to auto. It, it, you know, I think it's a separate question whether or not Tesla's, Tesla's overvalued and whether or not the unit economics on the Model Three work. Right. Um, but you know, if if you think about legacy and the impact that anybody of our generation is going to have, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who's having more impact than Elon Musk today. Okay, so let's go to the next person: SoftBank's uh, Masayoshi Son, Godzilla, or Ultraman? Oh, yeah, I'm not familiar this. with Ultraman. Uh, Ultraman. So, so I'll, I'll say <laughs> Ultraman. That sounds more favorable than Godzilla. You know, <laughs> a, a, another very smart, savvy investor. I think. Uh, He's done a great job at, at, uh, at expanding beyond Japan, which is in, in many ways a, uh, a very tough place to operate, yeah. from, especially from a regulatory perspective. So, so he's put together a $100 billion fund, and again, he's betting on 5G, IoT, AI, and robotics, right? So if I give you $100 billion each, what problem would you solve in travel to create safer and better travel? I mean... I'd like to go back to 1976, where people could fly to Paris in three and a half hours yes, from the east coast of the U.S. Here, here. Um, what was that plane called again? <laughs> the Concorde, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think everything needs to change. I think um, cars on demand, self-driving cars, okay. I think that's really important. I would like to see planes improve. So faster, faster transportation. Yeah. What about you, Steve? Same. I think, I think you know, we, we have all innovated on the service layer and, and most of the people in the room are, are working on the service layer. But, you know, the true innovation, I think, is going to be actually owning and operating the assets. So the, the airplanes, the hotels, not so much the cars, obviously. But, um, but that, that aspect is hugely capital intensive. It's ripe for, uh, for new ideas, and, and uh, someone will get there. So I don't have 100 hardware, billion, so it won't be Owning big. hardware as opposed to... Right now, the online industry, which is very asset light. Well, I, I think if you own and operate the hardware, you can do a lot more on the innovation side for the service and software layer. Right. I think, to, I mean, the genius of what Moss is doing is you have a country facing an existential threat in the form of Saudi Arabia that is trying to monetize $500 billion of oil assets, fossil fuel assets, into technology assets, which if we were sitting in their shoes, we'd be doing the same thing. Masa was smart enough to understand that he's, you know, we're going to have a vision two that's going to be two to three hundred billion. He's working on an SPV that's a trillion. Um, you know, Masa was one of the early investors in online travel in the U.S. He backed our company in 1999. Uh, you know, again, for me, this gets back to having this perspective. His perspective is, I am going to build a global index fund 
on private technology. And if, if somebody said to, to, to the three of us, I'll give you $300 billion, go, buy, go build a global index fund on technology, would you bet that that's going to compound at 10%? By the way, if he compounds at 7% on $100 billion, he's going to make $20 billion. So smart move. Right. So, I mean, and, and I would say the final thing is <clears throat> capital um, in a world where scale matters more than ever, Capital creates advantage. It can create winners. So what he said to Uber is, Uber, you either take my $20 billion or I'll go buy Lyft, right? So, I mean, there is, uh, I, I think it's putting your finger in the scale that is in a way we haven't quite seen, and I think it's going to be right. extraordinarily disruptive uh, to, to the world in which I operate, which is late stage investing. So, so if, you know, if it creates scale and scale creates advantage and all that, so clearly we're moving into that sort of big, big gets bigger, right? And already the world is being dominated by too few big players. Don't you worry about the industry, which absolutely relies on diversity to keep travelers happy, your customers happy? All those little people are going to get crushed. Do you worry about that? Uh, go ahead. Okay, Steve. No, 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 you're that. doing a good job with uh, the mic. <laughs> Filibustering. Um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good way to sell papers. I saw the FT piece and the others. But the, the reality is, at any point in time, there's always going to be a, a group of companies that people perceive as, as too big to, to fail um, and that will dominate. And the, the reality is that just means the next wave of new entrants is coming up. You know, so for all, all people's talk about FANG, et cetera, Uber and Airbnb created almost $100 billion of market cap in the last six years, and no one, no one saw that coming. Right. So I, I'm... More to the point, I mean, Airbnb is a marketplace that is lighting up small businesses around the world. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, I, I, anybody, anybody can start a, you know, a small business today on that marketplace with global distribution or booking on day one. So, I mean, in many ways, these marketplaces are great democratizers. Um, of small business as opposed to squashing it. Even Amazon, uh, you know, the Amazon effect. Right. More than half of their revenue is marketplace, which is allow giving a distribution vehicle to small businesses to sell their wares. So the next big thing is network <coughs> effect that creates more and more entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, one stat, uh, one stat I'll share. In 2006, the top five internet companies represented about 70% of all internet market cap, 2006. 2012, still 70% of all internet market cap. By 2016, it was 92%. So there is absolutely an aggregation of power in the six global platforms and an aggregation of enterprise value in those platforms. But I don't know. For, that, for, go for ahead. publicly traded yeah, companies. For publicly traded companies. You know, the, the vast majority of guys, you know, that, that number will change when you get all the private companies who actually turn public. Okay, you know, so I'm, I'm going to have to race us through because we only have uh, 10 minutes left. Awesome. I want to see Gwen on stage. <laughs> so, you know, I was told that it would be, this would be a very challenging panel because I wouldn't be able to get a word in each way. So I came okay. up with a, a game. So you, you guys got the cards? Oh, yeah. So I'm going to ask you to take bets, okay, on, on what's going to... So I'm going to throw out a few things and then you bet out of those 10 cards. Um, AI, how much would you bet on AI? Well, I need to know what it's in One? comparison okay. to, but I'll oh. bet three. Three? Well, because your business is built on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, Steve, so, come on. so one is low? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll go with the one, too. AI is table stakes. Okay, so tell us about your, why you're kind of conservative on something that you're actually working with. Well, I mean, I, th I do think AI is going to change most industries. I'm particularly excited about AI that's developing its own algorithms that are faster rate than AI programmers can develop algorithms. And I think that type of advancement is going to accelerate innovation. So I think it's going to happen everywhere. I have just went to the Google Zeitgeist conference in Arizona last week, and it was pretty impressive watching their head of AI give a presentation about some of the things that Alphabet is working okay, on. So you think more is coming then? I okay. think more is coming more quickly. Right. Um, blockchain. Blockchain. Oh, Impact on travel or just relevance globally? Impact on travel. Impact on travel. Quick, quick, quick. I'm going quick, one. Guys. One? Yeah, I think we skip the cards and okay. we just give you our right. numbers. I'll okay. go two. <laughs> two? Okay, that's faster. One. Yeah, I, right. I don't even understand the application of blockchain to travel, but... All right, so let's, let's make a prediction, right? We're seeing uh, blending what you're talking about, buying hardware, I mean, hardware. Amazon buys Whole Foods, IKEA buy, buys TaskRabbit, Airbnb builds hotel. 
I mean, so supposedly, make a prediction. Sea Trade buys American Express, Priceline buys Hilton. Make a prediction. What will happen? I don't know. I want to buy Twitter and kick off Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Come on, come on. You, so you have to trump that. <laughs> um, did you just think of that? Yeah. Wow, that, that's good. That's quick. Okay, so yeah. Um, okay, so I'll be a, I'll be a little more boring. It's not a lightning round, but I do think um, we have a maturing of the public companies in the online travel space. Growth rates are slowing. Margins are coming down. We just saw earnings reports. You know, all of the we've had about thirty billion dollars of enterprise value knocked out of this category over the course of the last twelve months. It has huge implications for everybody in the room. Um, in that world, I think you're going to see more activity, not less. So the big are now <clears throat> orders of magnitude bigger than everybody else. And small to medium-sized companies, even, you know, obviously the largest in the space is Priceline. I think when we're sitting here three to five years from now, out of the five or six large public companies in online travel, I'll bet you half of them are no longer independent companies. <clears throat> what do you think of that? It's a safe bet. I mean, historically, that's, that's, that's true. A safe bet. That's true. You know, I, I think that the big guys, and I'm, I'm fortunate to work for one of them, are, are going to move into a differentiation of their, of their content and their services. And that, to my mind, means owning the assets. So I would, I would not surprise, be surprised to see people moving into the hotel space by actually owning floors or, or buildings or even chains. Right. Are we seeing that in, in Asia where actually uh, real estate companies now are investing in obviously, you know, companies like UWork, which is the WeWork of China. So we're seeing definitely the blurring of verticals. Okay, so the next big thing um, a lot of people are talking about is the next billion users, which are going to come from Asia, right? So how, what, what are they talking about here? Global tech brands keep talking about the next billion users in Asia. What are well, they talking about here? I mean, the applicability will be for any online business who wants to get access to more users. I think in order for that to happen, first of all, the handsets have to get much, much cheaper. The networks have to be much cheaper. But I think that as another billion people come online, it's going to benefit everyone. It'll benefit Airbnb. It'll benefit Uber. Right. So I think there's, there are forces in motion to try to get cell phones as cheap as possible, get networks cheaper. And then there are other companies that are going to take advantage of that. Okay. I mean, it's interesting, these <clears throat> high growth, you know, China, India, Southeast Asia have largely not been the domain for success by U.S. travel, uh, online travel companies. And so part of the challenge today, I think, is the areas on the planet with the highest growth are penetrated or dominated by local players, which is why you see Expedia investing in Traveloka, which is why you see Priceline investing in Trip and Meituan. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, it's going to be a different sort of growth by U.S. companies in those markets, but those users are obviously incredibly important. Yeah. So what yeah. are you going to do to grow the next billion users out of Asia? Run, that's, run commercials that's a, that's in a, South Korea? No, it's not, it's not about marketing. It's all sorts of having a great product. And I, I think on the, on the product side, we're, we're well behind the, the local market experts down there. And, and the other challenge uh, for any American or European company is just on the capital side, which Brad talked about earlier. Uh, it, capital is cheap in Asia, and you need a lot of it to succeed, and it's really tough for a publicly traded company to, to execute against that strategy without taking it in the shorts in the stock market. All right, so then other than you three, who do you, who's a genius in the industry? Who, who do you watch? <laughs> other than these two guys? <laughs> What's no, been the most, like what has been the most impressive thing that Steve has done since you left the company? <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a setup. Change, um, change the logo. Change the logo. Uh, uh, who, who really, else really good pop-ups. <laughs> <laughs> no geniuses. I don't know. I um, I recently started hanging out with Nate at Airbnb. I'm pretty impressed with him. Okay. Airbnb guys are are awesome. You know, and and I think Dara's going to do a great job at Uber. And and uh, you know, I I think the the real geniuses aren't actually at this conference. They're in China, honestly. I'd also say that, you know, I, I saw Bezos again this, speak again this weekend. Um, you know, again, relative to Elon, you think about what he's doing with Blue Origin, what he's doing to transform industry after industry, this advantage he has about time arbitrage, looking out of a five to seven year horizon. You know, Amazon has flirted with travel on two occasions. It's inconceivable to me 
that five years from today, Amazon doesn't have a meaningful play in travel. Um, in a world dominated by where data becomes the fuel for AI and machine learning, you can't avoid one of the largest commerce categories on the planet. Yeah. Um, and so I look really outside or adjacent to at you know, an Elon Musk, a, <clears throat> you know, a, a Jeff Bezos, a Jack Ma. I think they're all, um, their ambitions, their scope, and the impact they're having on the industry, so many industries, uh, it's hard to, hard to ignore. Okay, so second rule of the 48 laws of power. <clears throat> That's a book oh. I read, and I stopped at the third law. <laughs> so it says, never to put too much trust in friends. Wow. Learn how to use your enemies, right? So who do you think is the industry's out-of-the-box enemy? Or is there one? I mean, I think <clears throat> the, you know, listen, the, we've been talking about Google and travel for 10 years. Um, Google is the most profitable company in online travel. They have been for a long time. They're the largest player by a long shot. The reason margins are coming down in the industry is because people are paying more and more tax to Google. Um, and so, I think the challenge for every business, consumer internet business, travel or non-travel, is to develop a one-to-one -one relationship with your customer with fre frequent interaction. And so, you know, I think if you talk to Dara at Uber, he feels a lot better than he did when he was at Expedia, I would imagine, because he has a direct relationship with customers, he's interacting with them multiple times uh, a week, um, and his brand means push a button and get something now. Right. Um, so deep in the funnel, direct relationship. And so to me, you know, we've been saying this now for years, a, if you are a startup and your play is a derivative of Google, whether free search or paid search, do something else with your life. Did, did because you the value Steve creation is not durable. Did you <clears> just look <throat> at Steve when you said that? It, it actually were as Steve said to me when I when I was ranting about this earlier today. He said, "Well, it got me a nice fucking house." <laughs> <laughs> so, I was like, "Come over and swim in the pool, and we'll, we'll continue this conversation." So, so, <laughs> so I can't, I, 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 so, I can't so, deny that. So, Brett, based on your uh, you know criteria of one to one uh, frequent interaction, which uh, <clears throat> business would you bet on, Lola or Kayak? I'm not sure, uh, you know, Lola is, is embarking on a journey in corporate travel that, you know, is yet to unfold. I have an unbelievable amount of respect for Paul and his ability to, to build extraordinary products, so yet to be told. Okay. Um, but listen, I don't think MetaSearch is dead. I think this guy also has an unbelievable right. passion for great products, and so okay. um, I'm betting on I'm betting All on right, I want, I want to get into this last question because it's a favorite question. So sci-fi movies or books offer an informed, imagined view of the future. What is your favorite sci-fi movie? Well, I like uh, the Black Mirror episodes out of the I UK. I love that. Yeah, it's creepy, though. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, Ex Machina, I think, is probably the most interesting one to kind of tell the story of what we're likely to live through over the course of the next five to seven years. Not the part of the really hot, you know, kind of protagonist killing the, the head of search, but just, you know, what machine learning and AI and search are, are able to do. All right, Steve, the last word. You know, I, I'm, I'm partial to Planet of the Apes. There's just nothing funnier <laughs> than seeing an ape on screen doing things humans do. That's just me. What do you learn from that? <laughs> it's what just, do you learn it's from that? It's fun to watch. That's, and I can't be alone because they made a ton of those movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul, Brad, and Steve. Thanks. Thank you.